They almost like were offended. If you're going to kill somebody, kill them. When I first saw that, I was like, what the? What did you quit? Like, be weirder. That's the most inappropriate thing that you've done at a studio. Do you still think about that at night when you fall asleep? Where were you it? when Shark Tale came out? <laughs> no, I disagree. What's up with the, do you like all the blood and gore? Are you like a freak or something? <laughs> did I really do that? What did you tell me like five minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Project City. All right, welcome to Project City. Um, I'm Rad Seacrest, storyboard artist and director. I'm Brandon Dariani, writer, animator. Today our guest is Ian Abondo. Uh, how would you describe yourself? I'm a Filipino man. <laughs> oh, see, that's better than mine. I'm not. I'm not an actual animator yet. I'm like... Director, storyboard artist. My name's Ethan Becker. I'm a director, uh, animation director. Nice. What's what's your name? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit. You you do a little of everything: character design, storyboarding, directing. But let's start with the storyboarding stuff. If someone was gonna se- get an Ian Abondo scene, oh boy, what like what do you do? Like, what's your thing? What's your version of boarding? Like, why are they coming to you? What's my thing, or like, yeah, what, or, like, mm. like, if I'm like, I need an Ian Abondo scene, like, what is that? What do you do that's different than it? Because I kind of always look at people like board artists, almost like if you have an NBA team, you know, it's like, oh, oh this mm. person comes in and they do comedy. This person comes in and does action. This person's fast as hell, and we need shit to get done. This person's yeah, will make you cry. Like, yeah, like, what's your sweet spot? I feel like people tend to come to me for action. Mm. which is weird <laughs> uh i even from dreamworks days it was because i could like move the camera and there's sort of like this they like cinema yeah not everyone boards that way i guess yeah um or just like punch up stuff i don't i don't get tapped for comedy much oh interesting usually it's for like character scenes third act type stuff um or just like, you know, cinematic action. Yeah. None of which I feel I'm, I don't know. I don't know if I enjoy all that stuff that much, but yeah. Like I saw a scene of yours recently that you did for somebody and that just, it was just a simple scene. It wasn't an action scene. It was two people like at a desk type scene. Mm. And the acting was like incredible. I was like, holy oh. crap. Like it's just so solid it's so uh, it's funny that you say action because like from seeing that i'm like <laughs> oh if i need something with like really solid acting I'm get you. yeah well i mean i feel like like um that first 20 minutes of up like ronnie del carmen was always my benchmark mm. was like oh if i could do a scene like that that just makes people feel something but then and i remember talking to you about it at dreamworks where it was just i think i was working on crudes too and i i did some opening scene and then afterwards, like I was talking to Ryan Savis and he was like, how do you move the camera like that? And, but in my head, it was like, oh, well, that's sort of a means to an end. I don't really enjoy action scenes. Yeah. I like animating, kind of. I, I wonder for you, because for me, action scenes are the easiest scene to board. Yeah. Because there's so much action to cut on. Yeah. Like you can cut on anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like interesting. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think anyone can be interesting. But. I don't know. Isn't action like a lot of camera choices though? Because unless it's like a stale cut shot, it's just boring, right? I mean, there's a technical, there's definitely like a big technical demand to it, but it's not the same as like doing a dramatic, yeah, like dialogue scene where you have to actually understand the characters. And I feel like you have to risk a lot more when you do an acting scene because you have to like commit to an idea. You have to embody the characters in a certain way. And then, make an acting choice and be like, oh, these shots together say X. Whereas with action, I don't know, the dumb version is that you can kind of compile a lot of your favorite types of action scenes and that'll get by. But you can't really do that with a dialogue scene. I can't grab a shot from, I can't grab like the conversation from Inglorious Bastards and then just use it on Invincible. You know what I mean? It doesn't work like that. Yeah, for for action scenes, there's a lot of z-axis in and out of camera, and things flying by camera, and and following action and reacting to action. Um, that I think the difference between a great 
action scene and one that's like I have a hard time watching has more to do with the story. Like I, I honestly, I don't know. The shots could help, but like at the end of the day, if you don't care what the character is trying to get and the way they're doing things, the way they're thinking is interesting in the action scene. Like I don't care that the camera was moving and things were jumping and mm -hmm. the shots were cool. Kind of no, does nothing for no, me. I disagree. Because it's like okay, so if you're a Naruto <laughs> fan, there's one fight in particular that everybody loves, and it's the Naruto versus Sasuke fight when they were kids. Mm. They animated that so differently, and it's like really loose. The camera is always moving compared to like the hundreds of other fights that they have on that show. You know, it's just like there's something about that. I feel like fight you scene. look at it different after you've boarded enough action scenes. You're like, okay, I've been here, been done this. You know, it's like I just want to get to the point of why they're fighting, or that's how I feel mm -hmm. in my action scenes. I'm like, I, I don't care. I've I've made a million cool shots. I just want to get to the juice of it. But I know what you're talking about. I love that fight scene. That's a good fight that scene. Fight scene is sick. I mean, but there's a lot of context in that scene too. You know, the the, the relationship and stuff like that. Because otherwise, it could just be two people fighting. But I remember actually when I was working on, like, one of my first movies, I was on Despicable Me 2, and there was like this car chase in a mall. And I was boarding it in the back of one of your classes at CalArts, I think. Oh, nice. Because <laughs> um, I, I was like speaking that day. Was that the figure <clears throat> drawing class or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And I was, and you mentioned exactly that, where it's like, okay, I know it's a chase scene, but don't board the chase. Don't worry about the chase. Like, why are they chasing each other? And I was like, oh. And that I, sounds smart, but I don't remember <laughs> saying that. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, and I started my thumbnails over like that day, but man, that was forever ago. But you're saying exactly the same thing now. So that did I see the scene and say that after I saw your thumbnails, or did I just say that? No, I told you what it was, oh, and okay. I told you that I was like, oh yeah, and I, and you were like, it's not action scenes are not action scenes. They're they're character scenes, and there's like some action happening. So he's like, and you were like, what is it? And I was like, well, it's a car chase. And you were like, okay, but like, why are they chasing? And then I started to answer. You were like, that's what you board. Like, don't worry about the chase. Have you ever had a job where they ask you to board something like this, like a fight scene or a chase scene, and you, there is no like very clear motivation? So what's the solution to that? I feel like a lot of times. Yeah. I've, I've, well, yeah, I feel like a lot. Um, I guess it really depends on who you're working for, but most studios when it gets to the action stuff they really do just want it to be like cool yeah. and i feel like that's on that's the responsibility of the board artist to not just board like a give them the pages right back because we can do that with any kind of scene because we don't get that screen direction and action scenes it's kind of like if they're cool if the camera's moving in a lot of ways studios are are happy with that so but i feel like that's why we get a wide range of action and animation because studios don't know how to judge it like if stuff is happening cool on screen they don't question it as much as if you have a dialogue scene and the camera isn't cutting much then the, the studios get nervous and they're like how do we make this scene funnier you know but you don't i feel like with action scenes we don't get that kind of critical um those critical notes because if cool stuff is happening they kind of move on and they try to get to the parts that feel slow I, I do notice that even for myself, and this is maybe embarrassing to admit, but I will make it look prettier and, and make the shots look cooler if there's nothing going on in the story <laughs> because I have nothing to do. Because yeah. I'm like, this is awful. I'll make it look nice. And then if I know a scene is incredible, mm. it'll be like stick people because I don't care what it looks. I know this scene yeah. is going to kill or crush I could turn in the worst drawings mm -hmm. because like the scene is awesome. Yeah. So like sometimes you go to a screening and when it's the most beautiful screening you've ever seen, it's usually the worst movie. Yeah. <laughs> and when the, when it's all chicken scratch, those tend to be the best movies. Yeah. Yeah. I saw this post online just yesterday where they were like debating between who's more powerful, the, the writer or the director. And then it's like, you know, editors enter the chat. Well, that's but, different with TV or movies. Well, I mean, but either way, I still think that like, I I feel like writing is kind of king in that way. Like to, well, the, to the point that you're making is that if it's written really well, you don't have to work as hard. But if the writing isn't good, there isn't much you can do to save it. 
you know, um, in like, well, you can make that one scene amazing, mm. but then you go to watch the screening and it's one scene in a sea of stuff that doesn't add up. Yeah. 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 That's true. What, what is your like dream thing you want to be handed? Like you say you get handed action scenes and you, what did you say? Like, what, I don't know why or something like that, but yeah. like, what do you like guys, you should be handing me this kind of scene. Cause this is, mm. I could crush this. Damn. I don't know if I can think of that off the top of my head. Um, I mean, you crushed that kind of dramatic scene I saw. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, cause I think the outside of any sort of scene, and maybe this is why I'm not like pitching a lot of my stuff these, like right now I'm very, I'm motivated by learning in like a very stupid way. But if I'm not challenged by something, then I'm not really interested. I like to do things that I haven't done before. So you know, I remember you doing like a frame study day like every week, right? Back mm -hmm. at DreamWorks where you would pause films and do thumbnails. Mm -hmm. Are you still doing that kind of thing? Yeah, and I still teach. Nice. So I, I enjoy that, but yeah. I was in one of your classes and that was a cool, you showed us one of your first storyboards that got you at DreamWorks. And it was like a comedy about was Wait, it a cafe class? or was it a restaurant? What did you tell me like five minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> trying to be cool. No, um, it was a good, it was a good class, but you just showed us your first storyboard that got you the job at DreamWorks. Oh yeah, that peanut butter thing. I don't yeah. even remember. It was like a, like a Seinfeld sequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I really like character stuff. I really like um, where there's, where there's a lot of subtext. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to like your point of what you're saying when, when the director or whoever's on it, they they know that what they want to say isn't on the page, and they can articulate that. I because that can be anything. I think that those are like my favorite types of scenes where it's like okay, so the camera. I I, I like using the camera as a character, where it's not just about the performance and things like that, but it's like um, very edit dependent. Um, I like sitting in in edit and and really chopping things up and being specific about timing and sound and things like that. So, um, yeah. Have you noticed a difference? Because you, you jump back and forth between, um, are you allowed to say the show you've worked on in the past? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in TV, name a few shows for, for people that you've worked on. Uh, was on um, My Dad the Bounty Hunter, uh, Blue Eyed Samurai, I'm on Invincible right now. Awesome. Yeah. Blue Eyed Samurai blew up. Yeah. That was really well received. It was so good. Yeah, that was. Not, I mean, it got renewed for another season. So I, I'm curious what your edit experience is like in a show like Blue Eyed Samurai or or any of the other shows or uh, Invincibles versus like when you're at a movie on a movie. Hmm. Well, I mean, I think that edit is. Uh, it's only if you're in leadership. So yeah. I didn't. I wasn't directing on Samurai, and I, I and but I feel like. I don't know if it's a hot take, but studios need to let everyone into the edit process. I think that it makes board artists better. Kind of lets you know like how your what your actual what actual decisions you should be making when you're boarding. It it can stop you from over animating, over cutting. Did you never get called in to edit a feature? Uh, I'd have to ask for it. Okay. Yeah. It probably depends on the director because like when we would work with Tom McGrath. Oh, on like Boss on, Baby and Megamind. Yeah, he always brought us in to edit when they were in like the middle of it, mm -hmm. and he'd play it, and then he'd explain what he needed. So and that's rare. You, you would like kind of, you would keep editing your own sequence with the editor, mm -hmm. and then the editor would just call you and show you. Um, and that was interesting because like, after seeing two three scenes of what they were doing with my scenes, it changed the way I boarded. Because oh, I was for like, sure, yeah. oh, this kind of shot is always going to get cut. Yeah. They keep asking for this kind of shot. Yeah. Like I noticed like on Megamind, they're like, they kept asking me to insert close-ups to get the facial expressions because mm -hmm. I was cutting it more um, POVs and, and, and wider kinds of shots. And I wasn't like checking in on expressions a lot. Mm -hmm. And like that kind of changed the way I boarded. Yeah. Um, so for you, it was more on like Blue Eyed Samurai and and Invincibles. You were directing. Oh, I mean, on Dad the Bounty Hunter was directing and, and Invincible, and but I don't think I've really been in edit much in on, on features. All the features I've been on, like they don't really. We get to see the cut, but we don't get to sit there and like 
you know, the director wouldn't talk us through decisions. But I feel like because they were series shows, it's just more, there's something about the edit that's more like practical. Yeah. Because the timeline is shorter and the budgets and so on. It's more about like the things you're trying to be clear about in edit and in, in series. I'm curious. It, it feels more creative in features because, you know, I mean, granted, like feature animatics too, they tend to be a lot rougher and like not as like polished. Yeah. Um, I noticed too in television, they would leave timing in for the animation. Mm -hmm. Like if the board looked a little funky, but yeah. they knew they needed the time for the animation, they'd leave that time. Yeah. In feature, they would never do that because it's like it just wall. needs to look good for your animatic screening and get approved. Yeah. And later when they do the animation, the timing could be totally different and they'll, they do a, more passes, more iterative passes, but it's about make this joke land in the storyboard. Yes. And now we got to make it land again in the animation, but those are two separate yeah. issues. Whereas in TV, they were like, this looks weird as a board, but we have to leave this timing because when it gets animated, it'll look better then. Mm -hmm. Like it was a different way of thinking. Yeah. 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 It's almost like in feature. It's like a, it's just like another round. It's like a, it doesn't represent the final product. So you can just make something really pretty. But I mean, they stress that all the time, like especially on Invincible. It's sort of like, we know you guys want beautiful, you know, so and so and so, but it's like, that's not what the vendor needs communicated. Mm. So don't worry about like pretty boards or pretty whatever. It needs to be clear for the vendor. And so I think in, in some ways it's, I mean, I like working with limitations, but it does feel in TV. And I, I'm curious about your guys' experience. It's in TV. It's almost like it's not the full weight of what a storyboard could be, because things that would look cool, like you're saying, are very easily lost in translation, um, unless your action notes are like tip top. <laughs> Did you unless guys it's like keyframed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, do you guys do that in all your shows? Are action notes or X X, uh, X it, notes? It like depends who your vendor is, because certain vendors. Like when we worked with Mir, mm -hmm. they almost like were offended. Oh, like, they, if, like oh. they told us, like if you send us a timing sheet, that's we are not going to use it. Oh, interesting. like we do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and we yeah, were like, yeah. yeah, dude. Like, yeah, you guys crush it. Like, we'll, we'll. So they wouldn't have read, even if notes. it was rough. Even if stuff you gave them was rough, they would still they could read it. Yeah, no, they they just were like, we're the, we we do that. Mm -hmm. You know. So, but then other vendors. They're like, you didn't send it, so it's going to be, it's on you. That mm. it's a problem, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you got to know, like, whether it's a CG show, a hand-drawn show, a, a, like, a flash puppet show. Like, I feel like they all need to be boarded a little different. Yeah. And the thing you send needs to be a little different. Yeah. But that's where I feel like feature, I was, like, spoiled. Yeah. If, if anyone's in feature, and then, I didn't work on my first TV show, I think, until almost, 10 years in i was on like a spider-man show it's way more work like it's physical manual labor yeah to work on a tv show yeah really yeah. oh uh, like a, like what you could do in one week would take you six weeks on a tv show because of the amount of manual labor of keyframes on model like all the like you're doing layout you know mm -hmm. like on feature someone else is going to do the layout mm -hmm. like you're just kind of doing a story pass yeah like it's, should this scene be in the movie yeah, yeah yeah or it's almost like boarding for ideas yeah i feel like boarding cinematically and like staging your shots in the way they should show up in film that's still like a pretty new thing in features yeah like a, a, everything i see coming from like i'm disney i guess it's still they it still feels like they board for the idea yeah. Then they board, you know, how the shot would appear on screen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, want, uh, I was going to say, I want to roll back a little bit and yeah. talk about how you got into animation. What was, uh, what were you doing in high school? Like, were you like, I'm going to go into animation or what were you thinking? I didn't even know. I, I had no idea what that was. I just knew that I liked to draw. I had a cousin that uh, growing up, he lived down the street from me and he turned his garage into a comic book studio. 
Oh, um, and he had a bunch of buddies in there. They had a studio called Black Velvet. They were making comics and pogs. Eric Canetti was in that group. Oh, wow. And um, so I knew him since I was like like seven or eight years old. So you were an L.A. native? Uh, yeah, Long Beach. Okay, Long Beach. Yeah. And then, um, but then I just wanted to do comics. I didn't, I had no idea. My cousin pointed me in the direction of Art Center. And that's where I found out about like visual development. And I was like, oh, maybe I'll do that and animation. Then I found out about storyboarding and um, thought I hated it. And my first portfolio got me like in like a interview with Adventure Time, like the first season. Nice. And it's like, oh, maybe I should try this a bit more. And I found out that the narrative, like the sequential storytelling, I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed the notes more than I enjoyed design notes. First time I did design freelance on something and they asked me to do it again, I was like, never in a million years I want to do this. We, we both did character design. And I remember yeah. I thought character design would be a cool job. And then when I did it, I was like, oh, I don't draw my own style. I got to match the <laughs> yeah. show style. So if I don't like the show, I'm not enjoying this. Yeah. And then it's that's, like, yeah, that's true. and yeah. you're not really drawing cool poses and cool drawings like you do with boarding. It was like kind of lame. Mm -hmm. Poses. I don't know. What, what did I, no, you think? I took that one off of you because you were like, oh, well, and you, uh, I took uh, Gravity Falls off of you because yeah. you were like, oh, I have this thing. Like, do you, do you want to put your name in the hat, ring, in the, name in the ring for it? And um, and I thought it was going to be cool as well. But then it was just a bunch of T-poses and really specific, like, okay, the fingers are shaped like this and you're drawing them like this. And I was like, fuck this. <laughs> like, I don't want to do this. But with storyboarding, in a lot of ways, it's like outside of understanding that, like, the the tone of a show or something like that you're mostly doing you that's what i appreciated about dreamworks yeah. and they had the drive of everyone's work and it's like there's ne no board artist draws like another board artist which i think is really cool yeah um but and and yeah i i think that was something that i appreciated is that like I kept thinking I needed to draw like somebody. I remember you telling me your first, you still can't shake that like Danny Phantom. Oh yeah. <laughs> like shape language. You're like, you're, you're branded by your first job. But outside of that, like I get to make, I get to reference the movies I want to reference. I get to, you know, I get to make myself laugh with my own jokes and that stuff gets up on screen. But design wise, you can't really, yeah, you can't take those swings. What's up with the, do you like all the blood and gore? Are you like a freak or something? <laughs> or what all did you do on Invincible? Uh, so I was directing on season two and three. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it was, I think what I liked about it was that um, it's like an adult show that deals with adult themes. Um, the main character is like an Asian American dude, which I think outside of one random character on a Minion movie, I'd like never drawn an Asian person like in animation. Um, and and they allow the show to be slow you know they allow for like pauses and characters they to do breathe. that i just watched a recent s episode and i was i enjoyed the pacing yeah i was like i, I kind of like this they're like at home for a second then they're going fighting and killing and dying yeah that was nice yeah yeah, yeah. um and the gore is just you know i i like that it's not for spectacle i uh it, but it is the hook it is the yeah, yeah it is the hook i mean well i wonder like i guess i throw it out to you guys like we even at the studio we wonder it's like well is it the action is it the characters that people come back for but i mean either way it's sort of like um at least working on it and and working through the scripts with the showrunners like it doesn't feel like a one trick pony kind of show no i thought it was and then I, oh and i was like <laughs> yeah actually these relationships i'm kind of getting into and then whenever they're like suddenly killed or something you know i'm like wait what's gonna happen yeah and the only thing that kind of pisses me off is when they come back after they die mm. oh uh, if they do you mm -hmm. know that type of thing yeah because that's why i hate superheroes right if you're gonna kill somebody kill them yeah because you, you can't you fool me once but fool me twice yeah but fool me you know how that thing goes exactly yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i don't like that don't stop doing that <laughs> you know I'll, I'll run it up the flagpole we'll see we'll see how that goes Thank you. <laughs> hey i watched the saw movies for the family connections <laughs> <laughs> hey no one comes back in those movies man Does, you know? didn't didn't the guy who made the game come back he had cancer and then he comes back and then he... well it was like faked right he like faked it 
he pretended to be dead and then, and, then, and then he like came up off the table right yeah they yeah, thought he yeah. was dead but he was actually alive <laughs> squid game is another interesting one like that where you think you're getting into it for the blood and gore and you're just oh. you're just riveted by the storytelling mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i like seeing flawed characters like that dude was a gambler or whatever and i just i love that when they're like oh daddy's coming home soon and he's like not i'm going gambling <laughs> yeah. it's so funny i'm like hey <laughs> i think the best part of that show is when they get to go home after that first night yeah and then they make the choice to go back like that oh, that's beautiful mm. that's like a great i, I was watching it I, I can't turn off my analytical brain mm. but i was just like this is a great way to not have to do flashbacks oh <laughs> you know what i mean because you're seeing it in real time like what yeah. their problems are and what their life is like and yeah. then they go back it's like Oh, that's so clever. Because yeah. everyone else would have just d gone to a series of flashbacks of where did all these characters come from? What's right. their backstory? Yeah, that would have ruined the show. Yeah, that would like imagine every episode. There's like twenty that's minutes of sequel, flashback. Dude. Well, and they were willing to come back, yeah. you know, by choice. So then when they're dying, you're like, you chose this. Yeah, yeah. What was the most difficult thing about working on uh, Invincible for you? Hmm. Well, I mean, the crew was really great. Um, I think, I think, I don't know if it's it's specific to Invincible. I feel like in in directing, I think the most difficult thing is like really fighting for your team, like whatever that is. I I was surprised that um, as much as you're expected to cut the episodes and all that stuff, like you're also kind of like a therapist on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And if they're not if they're not motivated to do the job, that can be any number of reasons. Like and then it comes back to you. So you have to be like, all right, am I going to fight them or am I going to help them? Yeah. Yeah, I had to do the same thing during the pandemic. That was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Or whether it's like I mean giving them a break or um taking more of the coaching seat and being like, "Hey, like instead of like uh harping on a deadline right now, what if we do those like film studies? You know, what if we get together for an hour and we watch a movie and we talk about it? Dude, you're a good director. <laughs> that's 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 good. That's yeah, good. I mean, and then and then they get excited about it. Yeah, you know, and I think that also I don't. Um, and I'm curious for you guys. It's like I, not in a nihilistic way, but like I don't care about the final product in the way that I've heard maybe some toxic productions care of like well it's gotta be x y and z um to me it's like a good director gives their team as much ownership as possible lets them appreciate what that means not so we can just make a good episode but so when we leave the show or when they leave the show they have the confidence in themselves to work on another show to maybe see themselves as like a, a see the leadership qualities in themselves um, and so if the certain things slip between the cracks, like certain creative choices, for example, like, oh, I wish this scene would have had more of that, or, um, the, there was more intensity in these moments in my head. It's like, well, if I cared enough to, to get my hands dirty that way and reboard things, then, but I, I, I'm, I'm not that kind of director. Um, if, if certain things are a little bit funky and I feel like by and large, I let things ride um and be like okay well i want you guys for better or worse to see like what your choices were outside of like maybe timing things and maybe making it more e economic so the shot count is down or maybe st strengthening a pose here and there i'll do that but i don't want to be getting in and like reboarding things to my liking because a for me like that just that throws my my work-life balance out of whack in a way that i don't want and at the same time, it's sort of like, well, what was the point of having a team if all I was going to do was like go in and change 40% or more of what was there? Like, and, and, and on me too, because I, 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 like when you ask like what studios bring me in for, I think at this point in my career, there's an expectation that I come with good company. And so they trust me to bring people on like, well, where's my creative integrity if I bring people onto a show being like, we're fucking awesome. And then I just change everything, you know? And yeah. so I feel like um, 
and that's the fault on me in directing is if I'm not happy with what I get in the final edit, I'll just bring that to the next episode and try to be clearer about, and, and that's where in pre-launches, um, my write-ups are pretty long that it's like, okay, this is the plot of the, of this, of the scene, but these are the character moments we need to be tracking. Do you get that? Do you get how we, how we're supposed to feel? Do we get how the audience is supposed to feel? Do you need a film reference for this or can you take it? You know? Um, I try to be as buttoned up on that as possible. And then I, I leave it up to the board artists to, to take their swings. I got a question for you. How, how much do you communicate what you like and don't like ahead of time? So when they turn it in, they already know like what you're into. Cause this is something I learned Mm. where I'm like, I kept going like, no, I don't like this kind of joke. No, I don't like this kind of joke. Yeah. At, like every time it would come up or no, I don't like these kinds of shots no, or, or I like this kind of shot. I like, and I realized, oh, I got to communicate all that ahead of time. Mm. So people just know what I'm into, like mm. before they turn the scenes in. Yeah. Like, do you, do you think about that? Do you like let, do you, do you actually like write up a doc for your team? Like, these are shots I like for this show. Like we're doing mm. blue eyed samurai. It's got to be, let's do this kind of film language. You know, do you do anything yeah. like that for your team? I mean, well, I think because I'm still, I've only been directing for like five years. So I'm still learning. I, I'm that might be a more of a showrunner thing well, I mean, versus but, a director thing. But I, I get that too. Like it, I don't, I, I wonder if it's about experience or like, or temperament. Because some people they get into the seat and then and they they command the space that way right away, you know. Yeah. And I think that I'm still, um, even with constructive feedback, I think that I'm still getting comfortable in my skin in that way. Yeah. Of being vocal about that, I'm very vulnerable, like with my team. Um, and I think instead of getting on them about that or telling them like do it like this, because I'm still learning. Um, I think what I, I, I frame it from the perspective of what I'm learning. Gotcha. Cause I don't ever want someone to think that they have to like, I don't think, I don't ever want someone to think that they have to please me because mm. I'm not experienced in that space enough to even know what that means. I, I I've, st- I've put my foot in my mouth enough times already in the last five years where it's like, I asked for this thing and they gave it to me and it was wrong. Uh, um yeah. and and so that's where i step back and i'm i feel know. like that's okay to do right as long as you let them know this could be wrong but i need you to try it so we all know this didn't work yeah right isn't that like part of the process it it, it is but I, yeah. I, I think that in terms of like um like shaping creative decisions in that way i and maybe it's like a it's like a buyer's remorse thing that like i i struggle with it where it's like, oh man, did I, um, should I have just let them do what they wanted to do um, instead of trying to micromanage it too early? But I mean, honestly, I, and I'm a slow learner too. So I feel like, I feel like I'll get into my rhythm the more I do it. But do you have anything? Cause like for, I'll give you a, a couple examples yeah. where, where I'm like, no matter what, this is going to be a no go with me. Oh, okay. Like, it's <laughs> like, I, I just am not going to do a fart joke. Oh. Like I'm not gonna do a pun. Mm. I'm just gonna take it out, and like I might like a pun in person, but I'm not gonna put it on the show. Yeah. Um. There's a couple of shots that are like that for me. Like if it looks like a, a the camera's up in the corner of the room, three quarter down shot, like mm. as, as if it's a uh, security camera. Security camera, and there's no story point to doing that. Yeah. Like if there's a story point, why why did you put the three? But some people do it. Well, I just want to see where everybody is, you know? Right, right. Like, there's certain things where I'm like, I have a couple of, like, unless you have a reason for this, I'm always going to cut it. Okay. I'm always, like, I'm always going to cut a fart joke and be like, come up with something funnier. Yeah, yeah, That's not a fart joke. Like, you know? The the examples, okay, that's good. I I, I have a few of those, Because they would would keep creeping up, and every time I would have to, like, cut them down. And I'm like, this just, these things always pop up, and I'm always hatching in them. I'm like, (laughs) I should just let people know. Like, another one was um, on Kipo. Mm. Like when we were doing the mutants, Mm-mm. I I kept wanting to avoid classic things you see all the time. So if it was like a, 
a bear or something. It's like, oh, we've seen like a million bears in animation. Mm-hmm. Like try to do something a little weirder or different, you yeah. know, like a like the Daft Punk bees I thought were cool, <laughs> you know? Like like do something a little more eccentric or strange. When, like I, first, don't... when I first saw that, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I mean, but, I, but I knew that you were just laughing back there. But then like people would pitch like circus bear. You know mm. what I mean? So like you, you're trying to be like, oh, well, what do I think? Like, what am I trying to accomplish? Yeah. Like be weirder yeah. or like more outside the box. Like if you feel like you've seen it before, try to avoid it. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Uh, but there was, uh, I'm like, okay, so now when I work, I tend to just sort of establish the, here's the things that I'll tend to not be into. And here's mm. the things I'll be into. Yeah. Mine so it's like gore for no reason, unless it's the show, you mm-hmm. know, unless it's specifically the show, that's the thing. Yeah. Then I'm like, okay, I'm excited to get into this. Yeah. But gore for no reason. I just, I can't do it. Yeah. You know, just like suddenly somebody out of nowhere just gets cut in half or blasted in half and you see all the guts. Yeah. Why? Why? I do like that they're specific about that on the show. Like just blood and like when it's shown because so, sometimes we'll do it because are you we, talking about invincible invincible I, I i honestly i love watching the show before that yeah, yeah i was yeah. like okay i want to get into this to to see those really cool animated gory scenes yeah. i personally like that just because it's part of the mm-hmm. you know the thing yeah for sure um i think to that i think i don't like um like broad acting yeah sometimes people will take swings of like over articulating something um or if it's just like too goofy which is i feel like you got to read the room with that well like i think that depends on the context and because you worked on minions well yeah so like that fits i mean it, right it, it fits that but at the same time there's always regardless of what you're working on there's a line when you take it too far mm. you know and um but i mean yeah if you were on minions or a lot of these kinds of like more for kids animated things and i'm not gonna you know it's more vaudeville it's yeah it's more like striking big classic poses like bugs bunny yeah right or even like um i i kind of liked it in uh cloudy with a chance of meatballs mm-hmm. because like it just was that's what this looks like but then the same people did spider verse yeah and you could see they're not doing that they're, yeah. they're thinking about it yeah it's not just some people think this is how you draw poses versus yeah. like yeah does it fit the context of the show or the movie? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I guess I tend to I end up on projects more like that now. Like um, Spider-Verse? Spider-Verse or just more adult projects. I mean, or even on like Blue-Eyed Samurai was, you wouldn't, you would think um, based on the way certain sections of the script were written, it's like, oh, maybe I'll take a swing this way. And it's, it's more a reflection of the fact that um, in animation, that's what we're used to drawing. Yeah. So we have to turn that off. You know, um, I don't like that. I don't like cutting too much. Yeah. Um, I try to tell people to think of their scenes as like, like a Seinfeld scene. Like find like three to five cameras and like only cut when necessary. Um, and in general, like my episodes tend to be lower on the shot count. Um, so I, I mean, if you're working for me, that's for sure. It's like don't cut a lot. If there's a conversation, I don't need to cut every. People do this a lot where it's like someone's going to talk and then they're on screen and then someone else talks and then they're on screen. They don't think of those moments where you can have a shot breathe or like pre-lap, post-lap audio where the audio is on the back of a character's head kind of a thing. So, um, and it's very like picket fence, not only with dialogue, but also with performance or something. It's like this happens, so I cut and then this happens, so I cut. I need to see this person open a door. So it, and then now we have like. 15 disconnected shots where do you think that's coming from i think it's coming from a lack of watching like film i feel Um, like it's coming from uh, this rule of clarity people are always mm -hmm. like you need to be clear but that's not what that means like that's not the clarity it's the clarity on the story Mm -hmm. the clarity on the emphasis right but they're like we need to be clear on who's talking and wait will the audience know it's like come on the audience isn't that stupid I wonder if it's similar to the striking the pose thing where Mm -hmm. like when you watch like Spongebob, that type of striking the pose works really well. And that type of centered, simple framing and cutting works really well. And then people are trying to bring it into like a more 
cinematic thing and it's like it that doesn't work you yeah. know what I mean? Like the the pose striking SpongeBob poses don't work in the cinematic thing, and the same thing with the cutting, yeah. where they work really well in one type of thing. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't translate. Yeah, and it's also not just artists and board artists and animation people looking at at storyboards. I think that there you get that question all the time of like, well, will the audience get it? But behind the scenes, we're sitting back there being like, no, you don't get it. That's why you want us to, you know, do a close up of, of their hand in their pocket or something. Yeah. When, <laughs> when we don't need that. But yeah. So what are your favorite films or directors to study for animation? Just, I mean, you do film studies a lot. So I'm assuming you're studying more live action. Yeah. Um, I feel like, I feel like I go back to, Fincher a lot for how the the camera kind of leans on the pulse of a scene or kind of feels like a character, even though he's famously said that he doesn't think of it that way. Um, and I also like, um, I like the Coen brothers for how, like regardless of genre, they're able to kind of put their stamp on any kind of story. I mean, Tarantino does that too. Yeah. Um, but I feel like I, I I like it where when directors step into different genres and kind of like take their own swings with it. They're not known for like I try to get into Paul Thomas Anderson stuff and it's a little too like It's one thing. Like auteur for me. I, um I think it's funny that Coen Brothers would be my peak because I love how they jump around. They could do No Country for Old Man mm-hmm. or Hudsucker Proxy. Yeah. Or Raising Arizona. Like they're all over the map. Mm-hmm. But it's or that uh they did that like Western T V series. Oh yeah, Buster Scruggs. That thing was cool. They they did like four five or four or five different like westerns and killed every single one of them. And, and that was almost like a Bugs Bunny cartoon. Yeah. Well he, the first one was yeah. like the, the musical one. Yeah. Where the where he has, his smoke was still there when he like fell down and yeah, that was really fun. <laughs> so good. Um what do you think's like the most rewarding project you've worked on and then what's like one project that you thought like I'm going to quit. I can't do it anymore. Ooh. <laughs> or the one that I did quit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um uh rewarding i think it was uh my dad the bounty hunter at netflix because i worked with a bunch of friends that uh and i never directed before and uh, i helped them kind of green light the project when it was at um everett downing and patrick harpin we worked together at sony and uh have our have our our stories from from there um but they just put a lot of faith in me on that. They put a lot of faith in everyone, like a lot of first time leadership on that show. And I, I learned, I think from, from that, like how far empathy in the creative process can like, at the end of the day, you can't guarantee something's going to be great, but you can, you can guarantee that people learn and appreciate their time on a show. So I learned that from, from there and then and invincible was like that too because they brought me on and showed a lot of trust i i I changed the way that they expected um what the deadlines were for the for my first two seasons because they were like well we need it we need a clean split between like roughs and and cleans and i'm like well i'm more used to an iterative process in feature the iterative process is more important than the cleans if we can get the ideas right then the cleans will be easier. So they're like, what do you want? And I was like, I want like, I want nine weeks for roughs and I, and um, like four or five weeks for cleans. And they were like, all right, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. My boards ended up being a bit rougher, but like story wise, they did like, it was like, Oh, it's more character based storytelling. And it's a better show. Yeah. We, we kind of had a similar approach on Kipo where we're like, we favored the storytelling over how well it was going to be animated Mm, so we're like we'll give you more time to do the iterative and change stuff and if that means we're sacrificing like we have a couple wonky poses and the animation comes back messed up Mm -hmm. i'd rather have a show with messed up animation where you're actually enjoying the story because i've seen these shows where it's like a week on roughs and now we're just spending all our time making the yeah the 
in betweens of the key frame, and it looks beautiful. Right. But you can really tell, like, well, they sacrificed the story on this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, for sure. What did you quit? <laughs> oh yeah, man, I forgot. Um, or like a project that was just that like, you wanted to quit. Yeah. <laughs> there, 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 there are just studios out there where, like, they don't know. They don't know what they want to say with like the project and so um so you, you kind of end up like boarding it and then they they'll do a gag pass and then you board it again and then they do a gag pass. they think that that's what it needs and they're they're trying to just out funny themselves you know i mean i feel like the experience on the penguins movie was kind of like that yeah I, I mean everyone talked about it that way but any kind of project where you feel like or I feel like the directors, the people up top don't they're not like fully invested in trying to figure out what they want to say with it. And they're kind of just like making a movie. I'm get I, I feel like I sniff that out pretty quickly nowadays. And it's like, uh, like I love you guys, but like this is actually this is actually my muscles are atrophying kind of sitting here so i think i i think i need to move on do you think that's a thing that happens more in movies than in tv series i mean the thing with tv series is that they're short enough to it doesn't really matter you oh. know because then it, you're only on it for so many months whereas yeah. in a movie you could be locked in for a year or more or five years exactly like i've been on a lot of movies for five years yeah yeah, yeah. I'm, but that's also more of like the learning based stuff if i'm not learning something like and that's, I think that's when the studio gets in the way of me learning. Because they're like, no, no, keep doing it like this. And it's like, but you don't, you don't even know if that's what you want. Has there been a project that you have wanted to work on, but you haven't? Like an IP or anything that like, would be your dream to work on? I mean, it was Spider-Man. Like I was, oh, that was one, dude. Okay, so um, back, in the, back on the first Spider-Verse movie, like me and a ham, uh, that's how... Uh, Dad the Bounty Hunter kind of was born. A handful of us were brought to Sony under the guise of working on Spider-Verse, the first one. Um, and then it was like, oh, well, you know, we kind of stepped up, but we got this other one. And we were like, oh, what is it? And it was Emoji Movie. Oh, jeez. And so a bunch of us were like trapped on that movie. That's the only movie in the animation industry you can openly say is bad. <laughs> like every other movie you got to pretend because it's your buddies. You're like, oh, good job, guys. <laughs> No, well, I mean, but it's, yeah, I mean, I think that, but we knew, like, it was so transparent from top to bottom that, like, what that thing was. Yeah. Um, but anyway. When's the sequel? You know what? <laughs> when they get enough money. No, I don't know. That, yeah, that one swept at the Razzies. I don't know if they want to do that again. So you got off and went to Dad the Bounty Hunter. Yeah, I went, yeah, I went to, yeah. And the Bounty Hunter was born later on. You know, we were all the scars. But um, I really wanted to get on Spider-Man and, and, uh, especially from what it became like it was just it was very adult and i like that the first one was kind of like a cult classic people didn't know how to receive it but i was like spider-verse it, spider-verse it's like this is going to change i mean because it was that but then underneath it like alberto mielgo was in there adult animation a lot of what the you know this future of animation was coming out of that and then it it broke the animation industry in terms of like oh, yeah everything has to be stylized or else it just looks old mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting i saw a commercial the other day oh for, yeah for like an insurance like UPS or yeah, something, UP, right? it was ups it was no ups way. and it was in like a spider verse yeah. animation i was like how much did they spend on this <laughs> insane <laughs> must be ai there's mm -hmm. no way oh my god um <laughs> yeah like it, wait so did you get to work on it for a little bit uh no i i got onto the third one. Oh, uh, you didn't work on the first or the second no yeah, the the first one went by. The second one was well. I was at Netflix at at the time, um, and then the third one I was able to. Yeah, I mean, I'm you know, so I think that like before that it was oh I'd love to work for Pixar or something, but I feel, I feel like we're kind of, hmm, I feel like we're sort of in a like a dark age, yeah, in animation because on the one hand, um technology is sort of like at this exponential rate of growth but in terms of what we can do with it what people want to say with it what 
and where the investments and things are coming from it's like it hasn't caught up it's sort of like when you're when you're exercising and you're you're like you're lifting too much and you start to feel that kind of like ache in your in your elbows i feel like that's where animation is is that it's like we have all the stuff we can do but we don't know what to do with it and so there's this oversaturation of like there's oversaturation of um of uh adult comedies adult that don't com- get more than one or two seasons yeah i mean but oversaturation of like this style but the stories aren't evolving at the same level and they're not they're not amplifying I, I voices would, around i would argue though there's a few gems like like to me blue-eyed samurai was a gem mm. like even watching that character do keep repeatedly doing the wrong thing mm. you're like no she should stop this quest and like she's got a new buddy like, <laughs> yeah. like why you know yeah. or just like everything in that show was just like it was like a breaking bad level show in animation in the animation space where it's just like this is freaking cool mm. um it, even spider-verse and i liked i liked that ninja turtles movie too yeah um well i mean i think it goes back to that question though of like writing directing yeah is or the the like the animation is film like narrative i i like that they're saying that but animation isn't being supported in the scripts we're not getting like we're not seeing that writing where all these people are trying to get more unique types of stories and and an adult story doesn't have to be you know something really gruesome or you know um something really sad I, but i would actually it was interesting working at dreamworks during that time and i think they were a little influenced by the success of illumination um, where illumination would put out something that like you look at the mario brother you look at the minions it's it's a very targeted choice to be like this is a type of thing it's like a pop song right mm. like it's <clears throat> it, this is catchy it's a lot of people are going to show up with their kids it's it's going to make a lot of money because of the way we do the music, the way we do it's colorful, the way we make it silly. Mm. We don't. And I, th- I think DreamWorks tried to kind of chase that model mm. with Ruby and seeing it crash and them going, okay, I guess that's not a model to chase. <laughs> well, think about it though. Ruby came out at the same time as the little mermaid live action remake. Mm. Right. That was like, it's like right at that same time. If you're going to take, your daughter or your son or whoever to go watch that movie, you're going to choose the the Disney version of it just because it's a childhood classic for you mm. that you're now taking your kid to go see it. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to talk about financially why things fail or don't work. Like that first minions movie is an incredible film. Mm-hmm. like it's solid yeah. like you get the heartfelt feelings from the dude with the three little girls like you really feel it mm-hmm. and that kind of carried that studio for like a long time up until they had a success like mario movie which is probably the largest ip in history like like every single person from age zero to 40 or 50 had some some iteration of mario in their life in a mm-hmm. big way Mm-hmm. Like I was the first generations of Nintendo, like Mario, Super NES, like all that stuff. So like I'm gonna go watch it, and then my daughter playing Mario Kart, she's gonna go watch it. Mm-hmm. Like that thing's a freaking juggernaut, yeah. you know. But if you were trying to jump out the gate and like, if you're looking at Illumination success, well then you need to make a movie at the level of that first Minions movie, yeah. and not the third one yeah <laughs> you know what i mean because yeah. they go oh man that third minions movie crushed it it's just like silly yellow people running around yeah yeah <laughs> that's yeah. like hotel transylvania right yeah they have like so many of those yeah the first one was like pretty solid and then just fell off mm. how many are there four this is four yeah, <laughs> yeah. well they the, sony is crushing it with the spider-verse stuff i feel like um I can't talk about other projects there, but I feel like they kind of, that's their house thing now. You know, like they're going to make those kinds of killer movies. Yeah. Just well, like yeah. Stylistic. Just like. Yeah. I mean, with that and like. Maybe Mitchell's... a little older. 
like a little more mature. Mm-hmm. They kind of found that sweet spot. Mm-hmm. Well, and, I mean, you can't give out Spider Verse and then put out like Emoji Movie right after that. You know, it has to be the same kind of quality. If you set a standard for yourself as a studio, yeah, you probably they found their voice. I think yeah. with that. I love back in the day that Surfs Up movie. Oh man, Surfs Up was great. They talked about that though. That that was like it happened to come out at the same time as Happy Feet, and so it, it was the it, tenth Penguin movie. Yeah, but if people I mean, were done. Surfs Up is so good. It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> even to even still to like now, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but, but like DreamWorks does that all the time, right? Where they put out a movie kind of similar to what Disney's putting out. Like when Disney put out Coco, didn't DreamWorks put out? Well, so- Sony's different than DreamWorks. I think they only admitted to that once with like Ants, where he where. Oh no, they did it twice because they did it with um, Shark Tale and Nemo. <laughs> oh God, show. Yeah, the forgotten with the Angelina Jolie <laughs> no, fish. Never oh, forget, dude. Yeah. Where were forget. you when Shark Tale came out? <laughs> uh, let's get personal. Let's Ooh. dig in. Yeah. Um. What's your biggest fear? <laughs> Dude, I told you, my feet. I'm just kidding. What's the most inappropriate thing that you've done at a studio? Most inappropriate thing? Yeah. Or maybe second most. Hmm. Inappropriate, like like criminal? I mean, that could be. If you have a criminal story. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I think it was like the biggest like foot and mouth moment. And, Ooh, this is a good topic. I got a few of these. Yeah, and it, and it happened on emoji. It's funny. I, uh, a bunch of us were in a, in a room for like a like a punch up thing, um, and Conrad was on it at the time. Okay, Vernon. He was like a he was doing sequence directing for a few, and um, <clears throat> I didn't know that he. I didn't. I wasn't familiar with his f- filmography at the time, and so it was before the pitch happened or before like the meeting started. And I made a comment of like, oh yeah, like we're we're trying we're trying to like make this good. We're trying to make this good, right? Like we're not we're not intentionally trying to make a shitty movie like Monster vs. Aliens or something. <laughs> you didn't know he directed. And I said that and then everyone was like some people laughed and some people didn't. And then he was like, Oh, I like that one. I enjoyed directing that one. You know? Oh, he just put his <laughs> no. But then after, but the thing is, we were it, it. We it like he was nice about it, and afterwards, like we were we were cool. Like he yeah. he didn't take it in any type of way, and but in that moment, I was just like, and that's when from then on, I was like, I will never. Do you still think about that at night when you fall asleep? No, because he was really he was really <laughs> like he'd ask me to work on things with him. When oh, I, okay. When I see him, he's still really cool. He he had a drawing that I did of him in that meeting, like as his Instagram profile picture for like years oh, man. see is um, it better to tell the truth in a studio setting and like in that kind of environment well i mean but at the same time too like it's not like i even hated that movie like i like that movie and i i said that like as a joke in the room but he just happened to be the director of all the movies to pick the one he directed <laughs> <I know. laughs> um but i remember when it came out like i laughed my ass off at that movie but i and when i threw that out there and it was just like uh but good thing it was him, I guess, because if it was someone else, like that would have been it. That would have been I would have over. Dude, I, I remember I said something in a meeting, and the director <laughs> took me aside after, and he's like, "So they're trying to fire you." You oh. know, the producer 100 oh. percent was like, "Get this guy off the movie," <laughs> and he saved my job because he was like, and he was offended too, because oh. <laughs> and he was like, you know, man, when I was a young punk kid, like he had gone to Cal Arts, he's like right out of Cal Arts. I was like, these directors don't know what they're doing. And I told them, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, and when you said that, I was pissed. I was mad at you. And I was like, we should fire this kid. But then I was like, wait, because I, I was, you know, right out of school. It was like mm-hmm. first month on the job. Yeah. <laughs> like I needed to learn like not to be a dick basically. Yeah. But I think I was like, I was working on Megamind and, it, and I was like, we were in a meeting and they were like, why does everyone hate this movie? Like everyone's mad. Everyone's angry. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, can't we just try to make a good movie? And like <laughs> something similar, but like just such a, like, what are you doing, bro? Yeah. Like you, you're literally like a few weeks on the show. And he was like, I remember being like that. So just. Oh, come. Tom said that. No, someone else. Oh, but uh, <laughs> that, that movie had a couple directors, series of directors. Oh, but, um, he was like, don't, like, don't do that again, bro. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, and I was like, oh, man. That, 
what a what a nice thing. <laughs> I could have just been fired without. Like, Is that all you said? What did you really uh, say? No, I said yeah. something. I, it was a little bl- more blunt with yeah. it, and it was like a room full of the entire crew. And, but that's what you were insinuating. Yeah. It's like, well, why don't you just make it good? Yeah. Um, oh, man. I still cringe when I think about things I said early in my career that you learn not to say later. But you have to. Yeah, you kind of got to put your foot in your mouth, right? When yeah. you're young. <laughs> Unless someone tells you not to, like you have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mention that stuff when I teach. Just in case, like, hey, don't be like this. But I don't know. You know what I learned is to not use like negative words. Like, <laughs> I instead of saying I don't like that, oh. say, wouldn't it be cool if it wasn't bad? Yeah, no, just like, <laughs> oh, that's negative. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I always just flip it into like not using any negative negativity in it. Yeah, and, like trying to be positive. You yeah, know? like instead of this part's a problem say oh you know what would work really well if we did this here mm, oh look at that like i i noticed that kind of it makes <laughs> well, people's yeah. in, energy not defensive yeah especially if you're dealing with like multiple people mm-hmm. pro trip tip <laughs> <laughs> what would be a cool project for you let's say 20 years down the road where do you where do you see yourself mm, 20 years down the road retired <laughs> i got a i got a question that has to do with that but like earlier in your career how much did you care about your career versus what do you care about now oh yeah okay that's a good one <clears throat> um i think in the beginning i assumed that i would just be like i'd be a journeyman whatever just working off into the sunset kind of an artist and it felt like the animation industry was my oyster and, you know, like Ken Morrissey was my first office mate. And uh, first day he asked me like how old I was and he was like, oh, when you were so, you know, such and such, I was animating on Space Jam. And so it gave me this idea that it's like, oh, that, that'll be me. You know, in the future, I'll just be working with someone that was born in 2030. <laughs> and uh, but now it's like. I've had like I've had like a handful of existential crises since starting working and my relationship with my art has changed a lot like what is healthy and what is not um because I I just kind of cared about being better for me for a long time and I was like studying really hard and drawing all the time and I wasn't thinking about work um whereas now it's like i think that i you can't be in this business forever and not appreciate that you can be in a position of influence um and that you can do something positive with that whether it's like re like really getting to know yourself and telling a story that you've always wanted to tell or amplifying voices something like that i never thought that way before i just wanted to be i was happy being a cog in the wheel or like a cog in the in the clock kind of a thing and doing being really good at that like the technical skill of it yeah there were those people that like never wanted to be directors and just were like i just want to be board artist forever i thought that would be me but i think that like i'm getting more into writing now and i'm um I don't know where that will take me, but I feel like I won't be like boarding for much longer. And I think that like um, doing more creative consulting and and show running, like I, I I imagine that's where I'll be. When you have when you say you had an existential crisis, do you feel like you need to leave something behind of worth? like in terms of what it's saying is that what you mean no no i it it was more that like i felt like i was defined by my art okay i was defined by like the, i am ian abondo artist yeah like okay. like and i it was negative it it wasn't a good thing for when someone to say like who are you it's like well i'm an artist but the way that i i saw my self worth came from how hard i felt i was grinding at this craft oh interesting um and it it had nothing to do with the job or whatever it was more like well am i committing myself to studying and really being um being diligent about it um 
and to the point where I was just like drawing all the time. And it was tough with social media and whatever is that that was my, that was like a reputation in some ways that I carried, but people on the outside couldn't see that it was like killing me to, oh, wow. to be like that. And so when people assume now that I'm just like super busy and um, working all the time or drawing all the time, in a way it's like, okay, if that was a symptom of it, that I appear more busy than I am, then I'll take that as a blessing. But, and I, I say this to my students all the time, it's sort of like, know why you are committing to like your art, have a healthy relationship with it. I think that my relationship was always healthy, but my work habits were unhealthy. Like working late into the night and weekends, you mm -hmm. mean? Yeah, because, and, and previous partners, it's like, it's not like I was even on the job. They were just like, what are you, you know, doing? And it's like, I'm just, I'm just doing the, I'm doing these studies, you know? And, um, so yeah. Were you dating other artists? Only once. Yeah. Well, only one other time. And it, it seemed like it was understood, but it, I mean, it was grating. Cause I was like, I mean, art center days, I, I carried that like 16, 18 hour, like schedule, like well past college. Oh. So um, but yeah, nowadays I feel like I have a healthier relationship with it. I have a healthy relationship with, my, with myself and I don't, you know, it's almost like I'm like recovering, like I'm an yeah. addict. Like I'll be, I'll be out at like a, a, f a function with like just a ton of people around and I'll be like, oh, past version of me would have like, you know, grabbed a napkin and like been like hungry to draw something. Yeah. You know? But now I'm just like, no, I can just hang out and be. Yeah. There's a lot of, I, I guess you would. I feel like I haven't had that existential crisis. Like I'm a little bit of a workaholic. Oh, like you, you, you've, you've maintained like the steady. Well, like I feel this is maybe too much information, but like, I just like to have these little goals in front of myself. I'm focused on like, it helps me. How's that anxiety, TMI? That's like anxiety that's normal. or stress. Mm. Oh, like it distracts you. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, oh. like I like to have like these kind of things. I'm always kind of just, I'm trying to do this, trying to do that, trying to do this mm. as a way to not think about the stresses of life. So yeah. you don't think like long-term, you think like short-term goals. Yeah, but I mean, I know that each project takes seven years, five years, so they're, they're never like this week. It's always like a long, long-term goal. Mm. Long-term goals like split into these little shorter sprints. Well, I'll be, you know, I'll be writing scripts at night or working on on stuff outside of work but just like for me i i do it almost as like a coping mechanism mm. you know what i mean i mean well see that's where the crisis came from you know what i wonder if it's how you <laughs> grew up too like because my parents both were always working all night all day if i ever saw them they were working oh so you just i kind grew of up in that avoided? kind of environment mm. i don't know what were your were your parents like that my dad was yeah. yeah, but I mean, I don't know. I I don't think I absorbed it in that way. Well, actually, no. Oh my god. Yeah, I did. I I I uncover that in therapy actually, mm -hmm. because my dad was like that, and it was a thing of like, um, and I'd had past partners ask me that, where it was sort of like, oh, if this goes the distance, like, do I have to worry about you, um, being at at your desk all the time, um, so. That's very much a Hollywood to, thing too, like where you hear about, maybe you hear about it more in live action where it's like, oh, that person's like never going to see their family. They're always going to be filming yeah. or on set. Yeah, yeah. Where it, in feature, it's like, it's expected you're working weekends and nights if you're directing, mm -hmm. like you're just, that's your life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that, that you do all that you do, and you ha and you're you're not like a one and done showrunner. Most people do it, and they're like, I don't want to do this anymore. But you're like, I can go again. You know what's weird is I had my kid right when that show started, mm. so I was almost forced to go against my natural nature oh. of going home and like having to do kid stuff, mm -hmm. which like fought against every ounce of my. Wow. What I would have done if I hadn't had a kid, I probably would have been working all night. Yeah. Like all weekend. But because I had a kid, it was like, oh, I guess I'm done at six. Yeah. You know, I guess I'm done. Yeah. Like on the weekends. Yeah. <laughs> he starts show running again. Oh my God, I'm pregnant again. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming.
Yeah. Where can folks check you out at? What are your socials? Uh, do I like point up and then they can like see it right here? Yeah, yeah you can work. do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's right. It's right here <laughs> or here. I'll give them cool. to you guys. Any uh, last bits of wisdom you want to leave people with? Care about what you do. Be intentional about like where you where you give your energy and what takes your energy. Mm. I think that that's that's huge. Nice. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. See you. Thank you.